Hello, I'm afraid this is going to be uh, another one of my slightly longer videos. Um, so uh, as you can see, we're focusing on qualitative interviewing today, and this is to provide an overview of the whole um, idea of undertaking interviews. So to begin with, just want to talk you through the different types of interview that you might undertake. Um, now, these um, there are various different types, and in fact, this is not an exhausted list, but um, the typical ones are semi-structured interviews, which is traditionally what most students tend to use because you actually have um, have a guide for the interview and this covers the main topics and the main questions you're going to ask and so most novice interviewers will use this approach but you can also have unstructured interviews and this is where the interviewer has a list of topics um, but um, they talk to people about them in a much more spontaneous way and are not in any particular order um, but you do tend to need to build up a bit of experience for that then there are informal interviews. Now, these are where you might have opportunistic moments to interview people. So, for example, if you're doing research on events management, it could be that you are uh, taking part in an event as a participant and an opportunity comes up to interview somebody. And that would be an informal interview. You get the same kind of thing, you know, maybe, you know, taking part in sports, also in tourism. These all often provide opportunities for informal interviews. And then there are uh, another form called narrative interviews. Now, these are interviews which are the narrative implies storytelling. So what you do is you're inviting your participants to tell a story. So they, they still can be quite structured so they can have questions, um, but they they largely focus on tell me about and you use tell me about a lot to actually get people to tell the story of something that's happened to them. So I've had um, a student who did her PhD actually using narrative interviews in tourism when she actually asked people about their tourism life history. So their past experiences in tourism from when they were young to present day. But there are other different kinds. So you need to have a look at the research methods books and have a think about this. But as I say, the most common one for, for students to use is semi-structured. Um, Whatever kind you do, there isn't a standard approach. So what you'll find that happens in an interview is, although you have a list of questions, sometimes you're, the person you're interviewing will answer one of your later questions quite early on, just as part of the conversation. And obviously, what you generally do then is tick that question off. So don't ask a question that someone's already answered because it will seem quite odd to the person who you're interviewing. So as it says there, um, while you have a list of themes, um, and the questions you're going to cover. These will vary from interview to interview. You don't necessarily ask all the questions. Um, and obviously this sometimes depends on what people have said in their answers. Um, so you basically respond to what your, your respondent is saying and issues that emerge. So if your respondent tells you something and you kind of go, OK, so that means that question is not relevant, don't go and ask that question. Um, and so, yeah, with an interview, you much more go with the flow of the conversation. You don't rigorously go through one by one. But when people are starting out, it often helps people to do that. But you will find that, you know, you often say a question and kind of go, OK, that's probably not relevant now. There are various ways, places that interviews are are useful. In fact, it is a very, very useful tool. So in, in sort of broad terms, we can use it in exploratory research. So if you want to actually try to understand what's happening, maybe in an area where there's very little research and we want to kind of gain new insights, it's really useful there. It can also be very good to describe things. So descriptive studies where we just want to understand, you know, what the, um, the patterns are with a particular um, topic of research. It can, but less often perhaps you'd be used in explanatory studies. So typically here, an explanatory study is often one um, that is quantitative. So we might have used a questionnaire that might have mapped out some relationships between variables. And where qualitative interviews might come is in understanding, OK, so we've done a quantitative study. We found this relationship between, you know, say, people's age and their use of social media. And we actually want to explore behind the statistics we want to understand you know and try to explain why that pattern that we found in the quantitative studies is there um, and then there's there's all sorts of other things so you know what what qualitative interviews are good at is you know first one there's detailed questioning of respondents you know so so things where you you really want to kind of get in in deep and understand something you know so like i've said their product and image perception of places this sort of thing 
can also be very helpful for discussing anything that's confidential or sensitive. Um, people don't like talking about their finances. Um, they particularly don't like talking about them in groups. And certainly an interview is better for those sorts of things. So anything that you think might be a bit sensitive or embarrassing to people, interviews are a good good place to be. Um, there's also situations where, as I said, there with strong social norms um, where, you know, sometimes there can be quite divided views on these topics. I mean, disciplining children is a very typical one there, you know, where people have very different views on this, but quite strong views on this. Um, so this perhaps is, um, I can't immediately think of examples that relate to sport, tourism, events or hospitality, but, you know, there might be things where you would think, OK, this, this could be a good approach to do interviews here. And then there's things related to understanding complicated behaviour. So, for example, buying behaviour. You know, so, for instance, you know, the processes and things that people might go through when they're buying sports clothing. Um, then other areas. So, you know, um, this is more focused on, you know, some, some of the things about who, but interviews with professional people. Um, professional people typically, you know, busy working senior people don't typically in, in, um, answer questionnaires, but they might respond to an interview. Interviews with different stakeholders. So, for instance, you know, the stakeholders in a tourism destination or the stakeholders around a live event, um, you know, they may well be willing to take part in an interview. Um, consumption experiences. So, you know, all the things that you're studying all involve a certain amount of consumption experience, you know, and they're quite sensory in nature. So quite helpful there. Useful where you want to get historical information. You can get historical information from a questionnaire, but if you want to actually try to dig a bit deep with someone and understand things that have happened in their past, it can be helpful. And then the final thing I've said there is with where there are um, very divergent experiences and what we might call outlier experiences. So people have experienced something in a very different way. It can be very helpful to understanding that. Um, when you're doing interviews, they can be, um, you know, the, the point here is about them being appealing to participants. And I've said in red there, no participants, not respondents. So when we talk about interviews and the people who take part, we usually refer to them as participants. Whereas in a quantitative study, like a questionnaire, we talk about respondents. Um, but as I said, with, you know, senior people in industry, they tend to be more likely to want to be interviewed than to complete a questionnaire. You know, they'd rather you talk to them and just ask the questions and they have to fill something in. Um, one thing where interviews can be very appealing is people often like the topic. If the topics of interest to them, they like to take part. I found that people um, enjoy talking about their tourism experiences. Um, so, you know, it's something that they enjoy and they want to relate you know, to other people about. And I think the same would apply within hospitality within event experiences, within sport experiences, something that people enjoy and they want to talk to you about. Um, and, um, you know, from a participant's point of view, you know, that last point there, people can actually reflect on their experiences, they can chat about them, they don't need to write anything down, it's kind of quite easy for them. So, in terms of the characteristics, it's, it's what we look for, they, they are conducted one-to-one. -one. Um, Occasionally you have um, one to two people in certain situations. So, for example, in tourism, I have sometimes interviewed um, two people together where they've been come as a couple. So, for example, in work that we've done at campsites, because quite often people camp in family groups and there are two adults, I will often interview the two adults together um, because they often ask to. And that can still be classed as an interview, but it's, you know, basically one very small group in that case. But anything much larger than that, and it's not, not really an interview. Um, now, generally, they last from half an hour to one hour. Um, you know, over an hour, it's quite demanding for both you as an interviewer and also for the person you're interviewing. Less than half an hour, you're probably not doing an in-depth interview. You know, you really aren't getting the kind of details you would need. Um, the focus is very much on open ended questions and, uh, you know, I'll talk sort of elsewhere about that in, a, in another video. And um, the order that the questions are asked, as always said, already said, is influenced by 
what the respondent answers or it should be participant their answers. We would tend to prompt people and again I will cover that in another uh, video and what we do is we record the responses so usually we take record on a phone or whatever other device and transcribe the data for analysis as transcription means we're actually going to type it all out so that we can kind of read it and look through it easily. So as I say at the end qualitative interviews they, they require quite a bit of preparation they are quite high risk but you get a lot out of them um, and um, but there is quite a bit of analysis involved afterwards. So in terms of the benefits they you know you can get a lot of depth of insight you can actually link responses to a particular participant. So often when you are trying to understand why someone has said something, you can actually look for reasons in other parts of their interview. You know who the person was, you know their characteristics. So you can kind of, if you kind of, if someone's sort of talking about being very time constrained in their tourism experiences, then you can look at that interview and kind of go, oh, okay, they've got two children who are under five. Um, you know, and that might be part of that explanation. So um, that's that's something quite useful. So you can look for explanations in other things that your participant has told you. You can freely exchange information. You don't have the peer or social pressure that you might get in a focus group. So um, where you sometimes find that people conform to what other people are saying. It can be much easier to arrange compared to a group interview like a focus in, um, like a focus group that can be really challenging to get people together interviews it's a lot lot easier and they can actually be very interesting i normally really enjoy them and they're, they're quite fun to do downside you get quite a lot of interview advice so you have to be quite careful about what you say to people because quite often you tell them answers to questions so what you say in your questions and what you say when you prompt people in their answers will lead your participants and you obviously need to look at your interview transcripts afterwards and and you know take that into account. Um, a lot depends on the skills of interviewers, and I sometimes find that when students are undertaking for interviews for the first time, they're very short, they don't get into the depth of detail. And um, they often, you know, so I often find that people's first interview isn't particularly good and that students then build their skills at doing it. Data analysis is unfortunately quite hard work, um, takes time to do. Interviews can also be quite costly, but that, that varies now. So one of the reasons why you know, they've traditionally been quite costly is usually because you need to travel to actually go and interview people face to face. Um, but what's been happening in recent years, and of course, obviously, the global pandemic has you know, increased that, is we've shifted to do a lot more online. So they're quite easy to undertake using tools like Zoom or Skype and they can be recorded and you still get the visual interaction with somebody. Um, you can also do them over the phone, but you lose the visual interaction. And then one of the last advantages is not, they're not representative. So because interviews, you carefully choose your participants, um, you're not able to generalize the results. You can't say in the findings from this study reflect everybody in society or everyone in a particular group. Really, you've got quite a distinctive group that you've um, chosen you know and your findings really reflect that group um, in terms of how you would go about conducting a qualitative interview we'll cover more on interview design in another session but your first thing is you select a sample and again we'll cover sampling decisions in another video you make the initial contact with potential participants um, and again we will go through various ethical considerations because for instance you will in that initial contact need to give them various information about your your project but you'll get in contact with people make arrangements select a location for the interview so it could be online through various tools or it could be you know where you meet someone face to face um, and then obviously you get to the interview you begin the interview you need to put the respondent at ease and build rapport so I often find it takes a few minutes for some people to relax into an interview. So you need to make sure you don't ask difficult questions at the start. Um, and I've often referred to what I call a cup of coffee moment in an interview. This is where I've gone to someone's home to interview them. And um, they're initially a bit tense. And then you start talking to them and about 15 minutes in, they suddenly remember things like, oh, I haven't, haven't made you a cup of coffee. 
I haven't, you know, and, and they suddenly realise that, you know, I'm a nice person and it's OK and you're talking about something interesting and, and that rapport gets going. So it does take a little bit of time. Um, I would typically at the start of the interview, if I've got the interview guide, I talk them through and just sort of say, look, these are the different areas we're going to cover. I'll explain any recording procedures, you know, so I'm going to record it on my phone and anything to do with confidentiality, anonymity. Um, so, you know, the process involves that kind of introduction at the start that we've just been through. There's also all we, we, we do have quite strict ethical protocols these days and permissions to record. So you've got to sort of start with all of that. Um, and I've already mentioned about starting with general questions that are easy to answer at the start. Don't don't ask someone about something really sensitive, really controversial right at the start. So start with some kind of general easy things. Then in your main body of your interview, this is where you're getting the data you really need. So you might ask some general questions at the start, which actually aren't too critical to your study. But the main body is where you get into the meat of your study. Um, and, you know, you need to be quite flexible here. And I've said iterative. So sometimes you might go back to something. I, um, I write myself notes when I'm interviewing people. If someone says something interesting, um, I jot it down so I don't forget about it. And then when they finish talking, I might take them back to the interesting point and ask them if they could expand on that. Um, so, um, you know, you, you will have some kind of interview schedule that you follow with your main questions. You can also use visual materials so you can bring things along for people to look at. You can prompt people. And we usually use positive, encouraging body language. And also if someone's gone off track, you can do the kind of sitting back, you know, which is the kind of cue for people to sort of stop talking about things. And then you need to kind of have a little bit of a cool down, a close period at the end. So don't leave, don't finish with a really difficult, controversial question that's made someone think and they felt a bit awkward. I often finish with a, a sort of, you know, a pleasant, interesting question for participants. And then you do your sort of thank yous and goodbyes. And then typically after an interview, um, you know, it's it's um, good practice to send your participants a copy of the, the interview transcript, you know, so they can kind of comment on anything that they think is inaccurate. Um, recording. Now, you can you can use voice recorders. Um, we do actually have some that you can borrow from um, at the university um, from the admin team. However, these days, most people don't need to because Almost all of you will have a phone that you're carrying around, which has got a really excellent voice recorder on. You can also record on laptops, iPads, these kinds of things. So they all have recording devices these days. Obviously, make sure it works. You can't take spare batteries along for a mobile, but make sure it's charged. But if you're using a voice recorder, take spare batteries. What you will find is um, if uh, you interview someone in lasts an hour, you just need to be prepared that when you come to transcribe your data, that will take eight hours. So it's quite, quite demanding. So other things are good practice. Think about your appearance. So when I've been interviewing people at a campsite, I tend to go in clothing that reflects what people might be going camping in. So I might wear jeans and a T-shirt. If it's a hot day, I might wear my shorts. But I wear something quite similar to the people that I'm interviewing. I wouldn't go in a suit because that would be quite strange at a campsite. Um, however, if I was going to interview um, uh, a senior businessman, I would probably go smartly dressed. Well, I would go smartly dressed. So just sort of think about that. Think where you're interviewing people. If you're doing it online, make sure you're in a quiet location so you're not interrupted. Um, if you're out and about somewhere, if you're doing it in cafes, just think about the cafe and the noise level. Coffee machines make a lot of noise, for instance, and that will drown out any recording you have. Um, I once interviewed someone at a train station in the cafe. Every time a train came through, we couldn't hear. <laughs> so, you know, just that was not ideal, but it happened to be for that person a very good place to interview them. So, um, you know, think about that quite carefully. Obviously, introduce yourself and, you know, what your project's around. Make sure you, you've done all the permissions to record and you take notes. Keep to the agreed time. Don't turn up late. Make sure you get there early. If you're doing it online, you know, get in there at the appropriate time. Um, be formal, be relaxed. OK, quite difficult. You're often quite nervous when you first interview people. Perhaps do someone you know first. 
um, you know, rather than, you know, um, the most difficult person you've found to contact. Um, present a natural front. And the idea here is you don't give your own opinion. So you don't chat about your own views on the topic and keep that out of it. Um, so I've already mentioned about trialing with a friend or family. So this is kind of like do a friendly person first. And that could be we don't typically do pilot interviews, but that we often do some kind of pilot test with a friend or family if we want to kind of make sure everything works OK. And it seems to be going the right sort of questions. Um, make sure you can read your interview guide. I often print it out in quite large font because um, well, these days my eyesight isn't so great. But, you know, when you're trying to talk to someone, you don't want to be pouring over tiny tests and be very cordial and appreciative. Even if, you know, someone says view, gives views that you don't necessarily agree with, you know, you need to keep that out of the, the process. OK, so now you need to go and have a look at some of the other, uh, another video which is related to doing developing interview design.